I think people have it wrong. They're like, when they get in the fairway bunker, they play the ball back because they think I got to hit the golf ball first. Well, they play the ball back. Now the shaft is leaning so far forward because you have it back that it's just driving down to the ground. Now they hit the green side bunker shot when they're trying to hit a fairway bunker shot. So I tell them, okay, let's put the ball up there where you hit a driver. And I'm talking about an accessible lie, like it's sitting on top of the sand. It's not buried or anything. But if it's like a reasonable fairway bunker shot where you have access to the back of the ball, I just say, okay, pretend that ball's on a short tee, put it forward in your stance like you're hitting a driver and just swing. And they catch it on the upswing. They hit it maybe a groove lower on the face, but it's clean, it's out of the bunker, and it's going pretty high. So that's how I hit fairway bunker shots. I do the exact opposite of what most people do. Golf Smarter, number 781. Mastering those scary golf shots that make you question your skills and make your knees buckle with Josh Zander. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Josh. Thanks, Fred. It's good to be with you again. It's good to be with you. Happy New Year, buddy. Hope the oh, family's yeah, we well. Can, we can still say that. Yeah, it's Happy New Year, even though we're in February. Yeah. Uh, you know what? It may be March when somebody listens to this, but still, That's true. it's the first time we're seeing each other this year and talking to each other. And not that I've not been following you on the Xander Golf app. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun. Trying to, I, I, you know, it's just informative, and I, that's what I love about it. But I know that there's a lot more to it. But um, I love watching the progress of your son's golf game <laughs> and his swing. <laughs> yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun project, challenging yeah. but fun. Yeah, we'll see where it goes. It, so there's a couple things from uh, some posts that I was reading that I want to grill you on today. Sure. Uh, but at first, I want to talk about. The Stanford Golf Course. I know that's what you're teaching at Stanford University. Mm -hmm. And how does that golf course, from your experience, compare with other university golf courses? Because there's not a lot of them, are there? Or is it? Yeah, there's. I don't think there's that many uh, university golf courses. Um, I think a lot of universities just have affiliations with nice golf courses in their area, and some some universities have affiliations with with more than one. So it's kind of nice to get a variety. But Stanford is wow. old school. It's a George Thomas design. It's really a solid, straightforward, challenging golf course. Um, they've actually done some. Um, uh, bunker changes to accommodate some of the uh, equipment changes because the golf course, um, a lot of the bunkers are being, you know, just flown over with no problem by a lot of the college players. So they had to move them a little bit further out, which has actually made the golf course, I believe, a little easier for the recreational player because they don't reach some of those bunkers that are out there now and made it a little more challenging for the, uh, uh, for the you know, the long hitters out there, which is pretty much all the college golf golfers these uh, you know these days power is just such a big part of the game so so you know uh, Stan stanford golf course yeah. it's just a solid golf course really well designed and um you know george thomas who designed la country club and riviera and just a just a great you know great architect and i think uh, uh stanford golfers are very fortunate to uh, to have that as their home course absolutely absolutely um you uh, over the years that you've been there uh, and you've seen these young guns coming up, um, are you amazed at the kind of distance these kids are getting today? Yeah. And, and I kind of saw it. Well, well, I mean, everybody's hitting it long now. I think uh, uh, coach Conrad Ray told me a few months ago that there's the, the lowest club head speed on his team was 115, which is about tour average. So it just shows wow. you where the college wow. game is going. But, I caught a glimpse of it, you know, back in, I guess it was 1994 or five. I had a chance to play in a, in an alumni match. Uh, and I was paired with Tiger and I saw some of the lines he was taking and it was just unbelievable how far he was hitting that golf ball. And this is with the equipment from, you know, 25, 30 years ago. So, um, it, he showed me that, you know, kind of where the game was going and it, and it reminded me of the Jack Nicholas, uh, uh, the Bobby Jones quote about Jack Nicholas, you know, playing a game of which I'm unfamiliar. And I'm like, this is a totally different game because the, the golf course becomes a pretty easy par 68 because all the par fives are reachable with mid to short irons. And wow. now, you know, now par fours on tour are getting to be close to 500 yards 
just because that's that's how far they're hitting it now. And the average, I think, second shot into greens is seven and eight irons on tour, but the holes are, you know, close to 500 yards on the par four. So it's one of the things I tell my students. I said, if you want to play the game the, the way you're seeing the game on TV, then, you know, how far do you hit your driver? How far do you hit your seven iron? Add those two together. That's how far your par four should be on average. Something that the USGA has been trying to promote, the PGA has been trying to promote is teeing it forward to try to get people to enjoy the game more. So they're not hitting three shots to get to a par four. They can actually yeah. make some, have some birdie putts and have some eight irons in the greens instead of, you know, hitting driver, three wood and then wedge and playing it as a short par five. Uh, so it just depends. I think there's ego involved. A lot of players don't want to move up a tee, but, um, but I think, you know, frankly, I, I'm, I'm 52 now when I go to a golf course and people say, you want to play the tips? I'm like, not really. I hit the ball about 295, 300, and I'm not really interested in playing the tips because I kind of want to make some birdies and have some fun. This is my, this is my recreation. So exactly. but I did go down and play a LACC, um, I think about a year ago and I went and played where they played the Walker cup from. And, and so the par fours were almost all over 500 yards and I'm sitting oh, there going no. driver hybrid. It's like, everyone's like kind of one of those reachable par fives. So it's like a four is a really solid score because you're kind of hitting a, you know, a long iron or a, or a hybrid into the green. And then, you know, trying to get it down to two from there. So um, I think golf is a lot more fun when you can make some birdies, but yeah, you know, that's just my opinion. Oh boy. There's so much to unpack from what you just said. I'm going to stay with, I'm going to stay with playing it forward for a minute because yeah. I'm lucky because the guys that I play with have no problem playing from the whites. And when people are like, why aren't you playing from the blues? Like, why do I need to make golf harder than it already is? I, yeah. I, I just don't, I just, my ego doesn't get in the way. And it's like, no, I want to score. I want to be able to hit an, an eight iron a wedge. I, that's what I want to hit into the, to the green because that's what I'm seeing them do on TV. So why yeah. do I have to hit a, a hybrid as opposed to just, you know, having yeah, a, nice a shot those, that I feel really comfortable with. Right. And a lot of those greens aren't really designed to have a, you know, a long iron fly into it. They're designed to have like a seven or eight iron with a little higher trajectory where it can land a little softer. You know, we call it the land angle when I'm working with track man, we're, we're looking for that ball to come in at a 45 degree angle of descent, which they call land angle. And, you know, when you start hitting, you know, four irons and, and, and hybrids, you're not really getting that, especially if you don't have the club head speed. Because part of part of hitting it high is having a lot of club head speed. And if you don't have that, you're going to no. hit the ball lower. And a lot of those greens aren't designed to to have a, uh, you know, a, a low shot coming in. Can't get to yeah. some of those pins. Yeah, well, and the strategy changes dramatically when when you have a longer shot to go in because you don't necessarily want to land it on the green, especially if the green is is um, not parallel with with the way the fairway is going, but perpendicular in it. So it's not that deep. You want to land it soft because inevitably there's going to be a bunker in front of there, in front and of the green. And something bad lurking behind <laughs> for your line drive <laughs> exactly. that goes over the green. And I tell yep. my players all the time, I'm like, one of the worst places to miss a shot is over the green. I mean, over the yeah. green is where double bogeys and triple bogeys happen, right? Because over the green is usually, uh, you know, a flower bed or a cart path or a down slope going to the next tee. It's just the, the hole's over. The architect's done. He's gone, gone off to the next hole. And Wally Goodwin, my coach in college, used to say, hey, if you're not sure, you know, just get it to the front of the green. You'll be chipping up the hill. And, you know, you'll make your par that way. Maybe we'll make a birdie. But if you fly over a green, you airmail a green, it's just a disaster. And at best, you're going to have some sort of downhill bunker shot or downhill chip shot, um, and which is hard to stop. So um, over the green is not – it's just not good. So flying a ball in low, ball tends to run through the green, not a great place to be. So tee it, tee it forward, have some fun, get a more lofty club in your hand. And you'll play the, the course the way it was designed and throw your ego out and have some fun. Have some fun. Yeah. yeah. You're always a lot happier with a lower score. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like, and, and it's amazing how very few numbers change from a, a two to a five that can ruin your day. And I don't mean on the whole, I mean, on your overall score, whether it's a, a, a 72 to a 75 or a 82 to 85 or you know, 92 to 95, that really has an impact. Those, those couple strokes. So make it a little easier on yourself. Come on. And then my other piece of advice would be don't, don't, uh, 
judge yourself based on your score. Don't that should not be what defines you as a person, right? Oh yes, I it think does. too many people are caught up. <laughs> too many people are caught up <laughs> in what they shot. I was one of those players because I was trying to play college golf and play for a living, and so I felt like my score defined me. And then one of my mentors, Chuck Hogan, said, "Don't let that little white ball tell you how to feel, and definitely don't let the score tell you how to feel." And it has nothing to do with you as a human being. So. Um, you know, find out why you're really playing the game. I asked one of my students the other day, it's like, you know, wh why do you play? Why do you play golf? And, and it's something that P.N. Lin from Vision 54, they call it the spirit of the game. So why are you, what are you doing it for? You know, are you doing it because you want to, you know, challenge yourself to see how good you can be? Are you doing it because um, you want to spend some time with friends? You want to get some exercise? I mean, what's your spirit of the game? I think it's important to understand that as a player. And it's very easy because you have to write down a score. And at the end of the day, people are going to ask you what you shot. Um, it's very easy to fall into you are your score. And, and you definitely want to want to move away from that because at the end of the day, it's just a number and it has nothing to do with you as a human being. So I think we've talked about this on this, on this podcast before where, where uh, I, I said, if I was the czar of golf and I could make the rules, I would eliminate scoring from everybody except for, competitive golfers because yeah. you're out there having a good time. Yep. yep. Why should you be miserable you, you on your day off? <laughs> yeah. You have, we have discussed that and you're right, but I, I found I listen, we're going to take a break and we'll talk more about this right after this. Yes, we, we have talked about that before on, on how it makes you feel. Uh, but, but Josh, I find that as I um, become a little more consistent in my scoring and I'm in a, a small range of what feels good, you know, I'm in the low 80s. And if I, if I have 80, 79, 77, 78, that's uh, a great day. Uh, 81, 82, 83, 84, okay, I'm fine with that. 85, 86, 87, I'm starting to feel a little frustrated. So it's not defining who I am, but it, it, I know it's so few strokes to really get caught up in those numbers. I understand, but when you're doing it over time, it's like little nuanced things can frustrate you. Yeah. It's like, what did well, I do? And then you start making changes and you. Well, yeah. And then just understanding, I think if you, if, if score is something that's important to you, which you know, I, it's understandable. Um, that's what you leave with. Start, yeah, start start to figure out why that score is that score. You know, and that's where you look into statistics and you look in understanding your whether it's a technique thing or whether it's a, a mental thing, um, whether it's a, a fitness thing. Hey, I, I tend to peter out on the back nine and maybe I'm not, you know, I'm not putting the nutrition I need in my body that that that's necessary for me to sustain that energy level I need for 18 holes. Am I walking? Am I riding? You know, whatever it is, but you need to kind of step outside yourself and, you know, whether it's with a coach or just kind of looking at your own game and understanding, you know, why, why was today an 86 instead of a 79, you know, what did I do differently on the day I shot 79? You know, what were, what were my misses? Do I understand my misses? Um, am I working, am I getting too in my own head mechanically when I'm playing golf? It's one of the things that, that, um, I don't know if we'll take this, this into a slightly different, um, uh, road as we're talking here, but like one of the things I want my students to, to be able to do is get up on the golf course and not worry about how they swing the golf club. Um, mm -hmm. you might have some checkpoints, but basically get out there and access whatever skills you do have and let those skills come out. And one of the, one of my jobs as a, as an instructor or coach is to help you understand how your body is designed to swing the golf club. And then once, once we understand that you can be yourself on the golf course and not try to be Adam Scott or whoever you're trying to emulate, because that may not be you, right? Cause we're all designed differently. And one of the things that you have to understand as a player is like, what, what, what should my swing look like based on how I, you know, how I'm built, how tall am I, how, you know, what's my, what's my wingspan? What's my, uh, um, how do I turn? How do I pivot around my body? And Mike Adams has done a great job. Terry Rolls and Mike Adams have really done a big push lately in helping the, the golf world understand that there are no outliers. Everybody is included in a system. You just have to understand what that system is. Yesterday I was giving a lesson to a, a brand new student, good athlete guy was about 30 years old. And, 
and he's hitting shots off to the right and he's hitting fat and thin. So his low points behind the ball. And, and he's like, man, I can, I can, uh, I can stripe it on the range. I get on the golf course and I, and I'm all over the place. And when he's in a repetitive environment, he can start to overcome some of his swing flaws. And so I said, well, let me do, let me do an assessment on you to understand how you should be swinging. So usually like my flow of a lesson will be, I'll interview the student, I'll uh, watch them hit some balls, ask them if they have, you know, any injuries I should be, I should know about. And then within about five minutes after seeing their swing and watching their ball flight, I'll do a, an assessment, a biomechanical assessment it takes about five minutes. And it's, it's Mike Adams who developed the assessment. And that arms me with exactly, now I understand how that person should move and should swing. Um, I feel kind of naked as an instructor without having done an assessment because at that point I can fix them and get them to hit the ball better in front of me, but I'm not going to make them repetitive. repetitive. My other mentor, Jim Hardy, uh, always talks about, you know, there's there's getting somebody to be to hit the ball solidly, and then there's getting somebody to hit the ball solidly and repetitively, which is now we're talking about somebody who can really go out there and play. So if you're not swinging the way you should swing um, biomechanically, if you're trying to be somebody you're not, if you're trying to imitate Trevino, but you're not designed like Trevino, if you're trying to be like Dustin Johnson, you're not designed like Dustin Johnson, then at best you're going to be inconsistent because you can't do it every time without thinking. If you start to move and set up the way you're designed to move, then you can go on autopilot and be more mentally free and picture shots and feel shots and not be so bogged down in all the mechanics of how to swing the club. So that's the player um, that you see that really excels on the golf course because they're not they're not trying so hard. The effort level is small because they're doing what they're designed to do. Jim Furyk is doing what he's designed to do. It's a funny Jim Furyk story. I have a uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine who I uh, uh, I was at a conference and he played college golf on Arizona's team at the same time Jim Furyk was there. And he was one of those marginal guys who sometimes traveled, sometimes didn't. He was like the number five or six man on the team. And when Furyk came in, this funky swing, somebody at some point told him, "You can't play college golf with that. It's just you're not that. That's not how good players swing." So Jim Furyk tried to start fixing his swing. And couldn't break 80. So Benjamin started getting a lot of starts because he was ahead of Fuhrer because Fuhrer couldn't, couldn't make the traveling squad. Mm. Well, after, after a little bit of time of not being able to break 80, Jim said, I'm going back to what I know how to do. And then couldn't, couldn't shoot over 70. And Benjamin was back on the bench. And, mm. and I was like, that's such a great story to understand and to help people understand that, hey, there's a reason why Jim swings the way he does. He's got a grip that puts his hand more on top. So he's more like Matt Wolf going back. And that's totally what he does. And he's designed to do that. And he can swing without thinking and hit great shots. But if he tries to be Adam Scott and put the club in a, you know, what we, what we term is a beautiful on playing position, he can't hit the golf ball from there. Um, and he can't do it repetitively. And even worse, if you start to do something that you're not biomechanically able to do, now you might even injure yourself and now you're really on the bench. Wow. So I've always been kind of, I don't know, um, frustrated because, you know, like a lot of teachers, I was a frustrated player. And I guess that's what gets you to succeed as a teacher is you start to dig and investigate and learn. And, and now you get to pass it on to others. But unfortunately, you sort of missed your window as a, as a, as a player to play at the highest level. Because I always, I could always um, rent it, so to speak, have it for a little bit of time and never really own it. Like Tiger talks mm -hmm. about owning his swing. The players who are swinging the way they're designed can get to the point where they own it or at least rent it for a long time. And the players who are trying to yeah. manufacture something because it's what they heard, you know, from a friend or read in a magazine or saw in a video or something, they're trying to do something that they're not, um, will never be successful, especially under the gun. And you put a little pressure on it, um, it's going to break. And hopefully you're not going to injure yourself by trying to do something that, that you can't do. Like sometimes I'll just kind of play around and say, well, what if I had Dustin Johnson's grip, which we call an under grip or what we term a strong grip. I say, well, all of a sudden now my elbow's much more in front. I've got a lot more side bend in my, in my body and I'm rotating a lot and I can actually hit it that way. And my body's in pain after I do it, I can hit it that way. I can't sustain that. And, um, so 
when you're trying to be somebody you're not, it's you're going to be frustrated as a golfer, which is where most people are. And I think that that as we start, start start to look at what's the future of golf instruction, the future of golf instruction is not leaving things to chance and really measuring people before we give them information. Um, and if if you're seeing somebody who's not really doing that, I think. It doesn't mean that you can't get better because they might hit on what you need, but it's a little bit too random for it to be like, yeah, I know if I do this, I'm going to get better. And one of the things that I found, and I know in my career as a teacher, is I'd have people who would come to me for a lesson. I'd fix them. They'd be striping it by the time they're left. They'd come back a couple weeks later saying, I did it with you, but I can't do it on my own. And I thought mm-hmm. to myself, there's something broken in the system where why can't they do it when I'm not there? And I don't, I don't want to have to babysit my players. Um, ultimately, you need those players to be able to do it themselves without, you know, I'm not saying they don't check in and come in for an occasional lesson, but they shouldn't have to come every couple of days to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it shouldn't be that hard for them to do. So once you start to measure them and understand exactly who they are, and you can put them into that method, which is what works for them. Then they're off to the races. Then they start coming back saying, man, now my index is going down. My scores are getting better. I'm not, I'm coming off the golf course with more energy than I started because I'm not worried so much about how to swing the club. Because by the time you finish a round of golf and you've been working on your swing for five hours, you're exhausted. And you should be able to, I think you should be able to come off the golf course with a lot of energy. Not, I mean, you know, depending on how, what kind of physical state you're in, but you shouldn't be, you know, struggling emotionally and mentally throughout the round to try to grind something out. It should be more effortless. And when you look at the top players and I'm looking at them all the time, I'm a, I'm a golfaholic as far as that's concerned. I, I just, I finished teaching and I'm like, I'll, I'll watch videos. I'll, you know, hey, watch way too much, just spend way too much time looking at, at golf stuff. But what, what I <laughs> think is the only pretty, one, but yeah, exactly. It's, it's kind of a religion for me. <laughs> Um, but, but w- what you find is the players who are succeeding and are winning tournaments and are playing at a, at, at a high level have either been coached into being who they are, or they figured it out. Like a Hogan would say, I found it in the dirt. They figured out, they experimented enough. They said, this is what works for me. And here's the key. And I think this is an attribute of a lot of good players. They're very headstrong and will be very particular about any information that they're putting in because that investment they've made into their golf game is pretty, pretty significant. And if you're going to mess with it, it better be correct. And so I take that very seriously from my point of view is I know that for a lot of the competitive players that I teach and even the recreational players, they value their ability to strike the golf ball. And any one thing I tell them is going to affect the quality of their strike. So it better be right. So going back to this guy, this 30 year old guy who comes in as I'm doing his measurements. And, and one of the things he had was a big sway off the ball and Hey, Greg Norman swayed off the ball and it works for him because he loaded up his right side. Well, then he got up there and just did, did a, a, what we call the pivot test. And he pivoted around his lead leg. And I said, boom, the detective has found your error. <laughs> You're pivoting around <laughs> the wrong leg. It's like, and all of a sudden I got him to pivot around his left leg and it was smash, 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 smash. He's like, you gotta be kidding. I said, well, you're only one leg off. <laughs> you're <laughs> pivoting around your right leg and you need to pivot around your left. And when you start to measure people, you realize it's about a third, a third, a third. There's some people who pivot around their center like a, like a Justin Rose. There's people who pivot around their left like a Cameron Champ or Bryson DeChambeau. And there's people who pivot around their right like a, like a Greg Norman and, uh, and Gary Woodland. And so there's great players in every category. But if you're if you are, hey, I want to be like Greg Norman, move off the ball and then slide into it. And you're a front post golfer and you should be pivoting around your left leg, more stack and tilty, if you will. You're going down the wrong road. And that's what was happening with this guy. He's like, I shoot 90. I'm like, this guy should be shooting 75s. He's a good athlete, strong, 110 mile an hour club head speed, beautiful flow to his swing. I'm like, we just need to get the bottom of the swing more forward. But it was interesting. Like when I was doing the investigative work with the measuring, it's like, Hey, here we go. Ding, ding, ding. We just found what you need. And there was one other thing he needed to do in his grip. And that was it. And so now, now he's like, okay, now I'll do some short game. (laughs) 
like great because <laughs> the striking is there and there's no mystery because one of the things that you see a lot of people on the range is they're always searching i'm going to throw this at the wall i'm going to throw that at the wall let's see if this works let's see if that works well yeah. wouldn't it be nice if you had a blueprint like this will work and i'm going to stick to it so i'll i'll stop haranguing you on all this now Oh, no, no, you're, you're hurrying the right guy because here I am talking to teachers all the time, getting all this information and trying to incorporate every piece of it. Actually, I'm reading a book right now. I think it's Your Golf Guru or The Golf Guru. Your Golf mm -hmm. Guru, I think it is, James Raganay. Um, and I'm going to be interviewing him in a couple of weeks. And his basic approach is the, the, the golf um, it takes an analytical approach to, to instruction, which is picking on the nuances or the individual elements as opposed to the systemic uh, view of golf, which is incorporating all of it mm -hmm. to, to go somewhere. Don't pick on this, that guy's thing and this guy's thing, which you were just talking about is, is, is look at the whole picture of the whole yeah. thing. And that's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're talking here to the original Jay-Z, Josh Zander. Uh -huh. And, and uh, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. On the Xander Golf app of yours that I was reviewing the other day, you had this video on there that I found absolutely fascinating about hitting out of the bunker and you want to hit under the ball, not behind the ball, which is, seems to be contradictory to what we hear all the time. You want to yeah. hit behind the ball. Please share that one. That was, that was a great tip. Yeah. So I think there's a misconception about what, what we're trying to do out of the bunker. And you hear you want to hit behind the ball. <clears throat> a better way of putting it would be you want to enter the sand behind the ball. So if we just think about where the club is first contacting the sand, that is technically behind the ball, but the, the club is still on its way down at that point, or should be on its way down. Because if you think about it, if you enter behind the ball and then the club is on its way up, you've just sculled it into the lip or across the green. So it's interesting you mentioned this because uh, I was looking at, you know, one of the best bunker players of all time is Gary Player. And on Instagram, of course, here I am, my you know, golf junkie looking at Instagram videos, and there's Gary Player holing it out of the bunker, you know, having a contest with his, with the, I guess he's, he has a contest with his grandson on the last hole. They always hit a bunker shot and he hold it. Now, hmm. Gary Player is one of the best bunker players of all time. And I, so, I, so I videotaped it and I slowed it down and I noticed that um, I said, I, I, I bet that his handle is ahead of the club head at, um, coming into impact. So he'll have some forward lean in his shaft. Well, sure enough, his handle is leaning forward. Now, when a handle is leaning forward at impact, the club is still descending. When a handle is leaning backwards at impact, the club is ascending. Okay. So he is hitting down and into the bunker because his handle's forward. So the club is entering the sand inch or two behind the ball, continuing to travel down under the ball and then comes out. So the low point of a bunker shot, the low point, not the entry point, is past the golf ball. Mm. And once you do that, you'll be so amazed at how you'll no longer uh, chunk and skull your bunker shots. And now you get to work on the fun stuff, which is your distance control and hitting your bunker shots close because your contact will be correct. But yeah, there, there's two pet peeves I have when people are talking about bunker shots. Number one is hitting behind the ball. Because now you're trying to enter behind the ball, but you're trying to hit past the ball. That's number one. The other one is swing out to in with an open face. I'm, not, I'm fine with the open face, but swinging out to in is a glancing blow, and you have some awful bunker shots. And I, I mean, I go way back on this one. Years ago, God, this was probably 20 years ago, I did a golfchannel.com video, um, and it was it was about setting up square in your bunker shots, not opening your stance, just setting up with a wide stance, flared feet, but everything parallel to the target line and they called it unconventional bunker advice that was their title for it because at, back mm -hmm. then everybody was like well open the face now open your stance and swing out to in swinging out to in people are glancing blows hitting off the toe some people even whiff they came across it so much and then sometimes the club was so outside that they hit it on the hosel and it's just like contact was all over the place i'm like let's swing this let's swing the club on a good plane in to in inside back to the target line back in and we'll create the downward strike by having the handle leaning forward at impact and if you want to open the face by all means open the face but all you have to do to make sure the ball doesn't go to the right is lower the handle 
So if you look on some of my Instagram videos on Xander Golf app, you'll always notice whenever I open the face, I lower the handle. Lowering the handle closes a club face. So if you think about like a, a, an uneven lie where the ball's above your feet, the club face is a right-handed player points to the left. It's closed because as you raise the club head up off the ground, the face points to the loft points more to the left. So if you want to open your club face to get more loft out of the bunker and the lie allows it, by all means, please do. And then just lower the handle. So you'll see me doing bunker shots. You'll see me with a wide stance standing far from the ball so I can let the handle go down and then open the face. And then I'll swing. But you're, when you say lower a, it, you're when you say lower it, you're bringing it towards. You're not going forward or backwards. You're just yeah. When I lower the, the handle, it's like if I just you're lowering your hands, like, right? Lower the hands. Make your hand feel like your knuckles are going to move closer to the sand, right? So you basically have a more horizontal shaft. Right? Are you when widening you your stance hand, as well? I, I widen my stance. I lower the handle. Mm -hmm. I lean the shaft forward. That allows the club to continue to travel downward. And I hit very close to the golf ball on my bunker shots because I'm not afraid of sculling it. I know my club is still traveling downward. And when you hit those bunker shots that are really crisp and have a lot of spin on them, those are the ones that you hit close to the ball. And most amateurs are fearful of hitting close to the ball because they think they're going to scull it. What they don't realize is their skulls really come from the fact that their club is now ascending through the ball. So they've got it all. They've got it backwards like a lot of people in golf. Everything's kind of counterintuitive. Well, if I move the club head closer to the ball, I'm going to now skull it. No, the farther it bottoms out behind the ball, the more it's going to be ascending through the ball. And that's why you skull it. And then I'll show them on video and they're like, oh, my God, you're right. The club is bottoming out way back there. And I caught that one on the upswing. I'm like, yeah. I said, now try to get your divot past the ball in this next one. All of a sudden, they hit that bunker shot that pops up really high and stops after one bounce. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I've just, the light bulb just went off. How many times have you heard, oh, my God, you're right? Uh, isn't, that you, isn't that why you came to me in the first place? Only, only in golf instruction. Other than that, I'm mostly wrong. <laughs> well, it's because you're a dad of two kids. Um, <laughs> we're going to be teenagers. Oh, are you going to oh, be boy. wrong? Uh, <laughs> Um, but when you're saying that the, you, you want the bottom of your swing to be in front of the ball in the bunker, how different is that than a normal strike with an iron? Don't you want the bottom of your art, the bottom of the swing, to be an inch or two in front of the ball? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, why is that so different? Why is that so different? Shot? Why is that a bunker shot so different than that? Why? Well, if the other thing is you have a more of a forward leaning handle, the club is going to oh. dig more, dig more, right? Which is what you want. Um, in the yes. in the full swing, you want some forward lean. Excuse me, but as you lean the shaft forward, your body's in the process of standing up and turning, right? Which allows the club to exit out of the out of the ground, so you don't dig as deep. In the bunker shots, you'll see like a really good bunker player. You won't see the finish so much up like you will in a full swing because we're not trying to sweep it. We're trying to hit more, more down and get under the ball. Now, here's the other interesting thing. Now, usually after I fix somebody in the bunker, I say, okay, let, let, me, let me just turn around and face the range. Let's go hit a fairway bunker shot. Now. And now guess what I tell them? If I'm trying to pick it cleanly out of the bunker, what do you think I want the handle now? Where do I want the yeah. bottom of the arc to be? Behind the ball. And catch the ball on the way up. Uh huh. So I, I I I think people have it wrong. They're like, when they get in the fairway bunker, they play the ball back because they think I got to hit the golf ball first. Well, they play the ball back. Now the shaft is leaning so far forward because you have it back that it's just driving down to the ground. Now they hit the greenside bunker shot when they're trying to hit a fairway bunker shot. <laughs> so I tell them, okay, let's put the ball up there where you hit a driver. And I'm talking about an accessible lie, like it's sitting on top of the sand. It's not buried or anything. But if it's like a reasonable fairway bunker shot where you have access to the back of the ball, I just say, okay, pretend that ball's on a short tee. Put it forward in your stance like you're hitting a driver and just swing. And they catch it on the upswing. They hit it maybe a groove lower on the face, but it's clean. It's out of the bunker, and it's going pretty high. So that's how I hit fairway bunker shots. So I do the exact opposite of what most people do. I have the handle more forward on greenside bunker shots and the handle more back on, on fairway bunker shots because I want to pick my fairway bunker shots clean and get them up over the lip. And greenside bunker shots, I want to be driving down and into the sand, and that'll pop the ball up. Awesome. That's fabulous. Those are all on – all those videos are on my app. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And um, plus, you've been on Golf Smarter many times, and we can hear you describing these things at length, yeah. as you do. Um, and, you know, we have lots of old episodes, obviously, of, of Golf Smarter, and we call it Golf Smarter Mulligans. And let's find out what's happening this week on Golf Smarter Mulligans. As I'm writing this copy for today's show, news just broke about Tiger's car accident this morning. All they're saying right now is that he has suffered moderate to critical leg injuries, that he had to be extricated from the car by jaws of life, and he's in surgery right now. Well, strangely coincidental, this week on Golf Smarter Mulligans, we go back to Sunday at the President's Cup at Harding Park in San Francisco back in 2009. It was my first time attending a professional golf event, so I wanted to capture the sounds and the people that you don't always hear on network TV. For a while, I positioned myself in the stands around the par 3 number 9 green, knowing that Tiger was a few groups behind. Now, I've always contended that you know exactly what's going on in a baseball game just by listening to the crowd sounds when we used to have fans at sporting events. Well, golf is similar. Up to this point on this par three, we've been hearing a lot of, ah, ah, as the crowd got excited about a putt, rolling to the hole, and then missing. Oh, and another one, ah, 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 ah. But Tiger was in control of this event, and his game was on fire as well. Here's what it sounded like when Tiger stepped up to the green facing a 25 to 30 foot putt. And that was a reaction to Tiger walking up to the green. There's no question. There's a sense of awe and amazement watching Tiger at work. The crowd is just rapt attention, knowing they're seeing one of the greatest players of all time. And here's Tiger on number nine, par three for his second shot. It just hung there for the longest time and then dropped everybody. You could tell. You could just tell. He is on his putting today. Unbelievable. Phenomenal job by Tiger Woods on number nine. Two birdies in a row. That's episode 97 of Golf Smarter Mulligans featuring my own reporting from the course at the President's Cup in 2009 being released this Friday. Both Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Please subscribe to both. And when you do, you'll be notified immediately when a brand new episode of either has downloaded to your favorite podcast app. Now, by the time you hear this, you'll know a lot more than I do about Tiger's condition. So let's just take a collective moment of silence for his well-being and full recovery so that maybe, just maybe, he can come back and win at least one more PGA event to be number one on the all-time wins list. Thank you. And good luck, Tiger. Another thing that you had, Josh Zander, on the Zander Golf app the, that I recently saw, but you was a, it was just a tease, so I want to pick your brain, and we don't have to do the whole thing, but you talked about scary shots. I found that really interesting, and I wanted to click and open it, but I, there was no link to it, so I couldn't. So I'm so happy that I was going to talk to you soon. Um, you, you list a variety of scary shots. We don't have to go through all of them, but why is that important for us to know and how to play them, and which, are you, which ones are you talking about? Well, that was actually an article I did in Golf Digest a couple months ago that was uh, Scary Shots. I think I probably just put it on the app just so people knew it was there. A lot mm -hmm. of people aren't reading golf magazines anymore. They're getting all their information mostly online. On YouTube. These days. Yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, or, yeah you, exactly. Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what I wanted to do there was just help people. Like, I, I, you know, you, you talk to your editor and like, we're going to call it scary shots. Like, hey, call it scary shots because, you know, that's that's going to grab attention, right? But what shots are scary. But, but the whole copies. idea is to, yeah, yeah so copy. So, so basically the idea is to kind of uncover that and say, they're not really that scary if you know what to do. Of right. Course. And, and, and so that was kind of the point behind it. Like, okay, this may appear to be challenging, but if you know what to do, you know, it doesn't become scary anymore. So I think, 
one of the things like uh, I, I tell people when I'm when I'm teaching, I, I often ask them, I say, do you want me to just tell you what to do or do you want to understand the why? And almost all of my students want to understand the why. And I love it when they do, because I think that if you understand the concept, you're more you're, you're you can buy in really to to the motion that you're trying to create. So one of the scary shots is, is you know, a narrow, a narrow tee shot. Right. So you get up there and there's like out of bounds and there's and there's whatever there's water or whatever there is. That's kind of, quote unquote, scaring you. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I got, again, I, I bring up Chuck Hogan a lot because he was such a good mental um, inspiration for my golf game and helped me understand what, you know, how the mind can play tricks. But he says, he says he's like, Josh, why is why they put white stakes over here? And I'm like, well, that's scary. It's out of bounds. You don't want to hit it there. He goes, why don't you think of it as helping define where the shot should go? Mm. As opposed to, oh, it's out of bounds. It's scary. It's like, no, it's out of bounds there. So I should hit it over here. It's just defining the boundaries of the golf course. It's like telling you where to go, right? Oh, there's water over here. So I'm going to aim it over here where I'm going to curve the ball away from it or whatever it happens to be. Um, so once you look at it that way, all of a sudden, maybe that's not so scary anymore. Or, oh, there's, you know, there's a, a cross bunker at 270 yards and I can't carry that. So I'm going to lay up short of it. It's not a scary shot anymore. I'm just going to take a club that's not going to reach it. Right. So whatever it is, if you understand it and you can think of it in a more positive way, just just it is what it is. Now it's helping me uh, help me make my decision. And now I can get hit the shot. And then the whole idea of like guiding the ball um, into into play versus letting it go. I bet you, your listeners, if they think back to their game, every time they try to guide it, they don't hit it nearly as well as when they just let it go. So going back to a little bit to our prior conversation, if you know who you are as far as biomechanics and you know how you should be swinging the club, you can totally let it go. If you've got the correct grip for you, you should be able to let it go and the club face squares by itself. If you have an incorrect grip for you, then you can't. So let's take, let's let's just say that it's a... Uh, a Xander golf student who knows what they're supposed to do. And now they've got that shot on the tee and they know they can let it go. And they know that it's just a boundary and we know where to aim. Now, all of a sudden that scariness goes away. Right. And you can free it up. And if you think about like when you watch the best players play, they're not holding back on their swing. They're just swinging. I remember years ago going to the tour championship when it was at Olympic club. And I'm watching David Frost. So here I am dating myself because David Frost got to be in his 60s by now. But I'm watching David Frost on the range and he's hitting six irons and he's hitting about 26 irons in a row. And they all look exactly the same. And same pure contact, same trajectory, same shot shape. And it was like if I looked away and looked back, it was like it was like rewinding and watching the same swing over and over again. And I'm like, how, how hard is he working? Not very hard. He's just swinging but he's swinging within what he, what he does. And those are the guys who are repetitive because they're not trying so hard to manufacture the shot. They already produce that shot by swinging freely. But in order to do that, there's some work that has to go on beforehand, right? There's, there's some work based on how you're designed that you can, that you can hit that shot over and over and over again. And then it becomes, yeah, let it go, let it go, let it go. It's, it's easy to tell someone like that to let it go. But if somebody is not, gripping it the way they're supposed to, or doesn't have, doesn't have their feet set up right, doesn't have the ball position right. When they let it go, the ball doesn't go where they want it to go. And so now they're in defensive mode. Terry Rolls likes to call it playing offense and defense. Like if you can let it go, you're playing offense. If you're trying to kind of manufacture or contrive something, you're playing defense and that's not going to last for very long. You want to be able to be on offense, especially if you're trying to play golf at a, at a high level or just to be the best golfer you can be. You don't want to have to hold back. And in, in the 25 plus years, I think I'm in my 26th year of teaching now, I've never heard a student ask me how to hit it shorter. They've always asked me how to hit it longer. <laughs> and I'll tell you one thing, you don't hit it longer by playing defense and holding on and guiding. You hit it longer by letting it go. Whatever power you do have, you need to be able to access it by letting it go. Free, freely release the club, freely move your body, whether you're a spinner, a, a, a glider, or a, you know, somebody explodes off the ground like a Justin Thomas. You need to access that biomechanics, whatever that is for you, and let it go. And um, that's, that's, a word, that's a phrase you hear a lot. I just let it go today, right? I just, I trusted it. I freed it up. That's when you're playing your best golf. And if, you're, mm -hmm. if, you, if you free it up and it doesn't go where you want it to go, 
then there's something wrong with how you're, you know, setting up to swing the golf club. Because ultimately, you just want to get up there. It's like taking one of those alignment rods and just swinging it through the air as fast as you can. You're totally just trying to make the loudest swish you can. You need to access that golf swing. Like Arnold Palmer would say, your swing, not my swing, your swing. What's your swing need to be? And then based on that, what do we need to do as coaches and as players to understand, hey, if this is going to be the way I'm the most powerful, what do I have to do at address to make sure that I can access that and not have to play defense, right? I want you to get up there and let it rip and know it's going to go down the fairway. And I tell people like the range shouldn't be, shouldn't be for, well, I got to go to the range for half an hour to figure out how the heck I'm going to swing the golf club today to make the ball go where I want it to go. The range should be a place for you to, I would say, not even warm up because you should be doing exercises to warm up before you even hit balls. Uh, but a range should be a place for like, hey, I'm going to hit some different shots to, you know, accommodate different holes that I'm going to play today. I'm going to, you know, play my low stinger on three. I'm going to hit a high hook on my on five and whatever it is, and kind of play shots that you're going to play. Maybe hit some short game shots, and then you're ready to go. It shouldn't be for, hey, I've got a man. What what tip? What thing do I have to do today to make this thing work? Because I can't let it go right now. I have to kind of hold on to hit the ball, and that's just it's just not fun. And you're not going to be as long as you'd like to be. And, that takes us back to our first thing we were talking about, which is like, tee it forward. <laughs> You're going to have to tee it forward because you can't let it go. <laughs> so right. let's find out who you are and then just absolutely let it go and have some fun and know your ball is going to go where, where it should go. That's different for everybody. Like, I feel like. Oh, you said should. The, yeah. the, the should yeah. is a problem. <laughs> it didn't go where it was supposed to. Where it, we it, should. Yeah. Exactly. And so it's not always going to go for where it's supposed to. And that's where being mentally resilient, um, that's where you got to go right. spend some time with Pia and Lynn and learn how to be able to accept shots that aren't perfect because we are human beings and, and recover. And I remember Tom Watson once saying, I've never hit two bad shots in a row. And I'm like, that's the, that's a, that's a, that's a player who's mentally strong because you can kind of get away with one bad shot, but you hit or two bad lying. shots in a row. Yeah, you can you can maybe make a bogey or maybe save a par with one bad shot. You hit two bad shots in a row, eh, you're really you're you're gonna have a big score on that hole. So um I think I think people need to understand or golfers need to understand, hey, am I the person, am I the textbook looking at him Scott guy, or am I the Matt Wolf guy, or am I the Jim Burek guy, or am I the Dustin Johnson guy? I mean, if somebody told Dustin Johnson you have to have a flat left wrist at the top and you have to set up parallel to the target line on the railroad tracks, Dustin Johnson's off the tour. If you say to Dustin Johnson, hey, you get to open your stance as much as you want, get your left arm super high, bow your wrist, and turn as hard as you can through the ball, you've got a world-class number one player. So imagine if Dustin Johnson's like, oh, let me read this book on how my V should be to my right shoulder, and I got to get my feet parallel to the target line. My ball position has to be here, and I want to restrict my hips and you imagine that lesson for him and you've ruined that player. You may have, you may have created a beautiful Adam Scott if that's how Adam Scott's designed to swing. And that's, you know, that's him, but you just got to be who you are. And the more, you know, I don't know how much more time we have, but I'll, sh I'll share another story. When I first started um, to get in this instruction business, one of the things I did was I ordered a whole bunch of videotapes um, from the past PGA coaching and teaching summits. And there was this one panel discussion where they asked all these top instructors. I can't remember which ones they were at the time, but this was back. This was probably back in the early 90s. And uh, uh, they were asked, what's the most important thing in the golf swing? And they each went about and talked about what they thought was the single most important thing. And one guy said grip. And I'm like, yeah, give me a break. The grip, uh, it's not sexy enough. I want to know about you know, explosiveness. I want to know about swing plane. I want to know about attack angles. I want to know about this kind of cool stuff. And he's like, no, it's the grip. And the more I teach and I realize that if you get somebody's grip, right, they can let it go. And if you get somebody's grip wrong, they can't let it go. They've got to manufacture mm -hmm. something. So if there's one thing that you want to make sure, you know, what your personal grip is, once you figure that out, you are just so far ahead of the game so many things fall in line. If we just talked about the trail hand grip, what that's responsible for, I'll just throw a couple at you and tell me if you think they're important. Your trail hand grip is responsible for attack angle, so hitting up or down. 
It's responsible for swing direction. It's responsible for club face position. So how about those three things? You think those are important? <laughs> it's responsible for some other things too, but if you just look at those three, like, hey, if I can compress the golf ball, if I can hit it where I want to hit it, and I can swing it in the direction I want to hit it, those three things are pretty important. But if your grip is wrong for you, those are going to be flaws. And oh my goodness, do you have a lot of work to do or a lot of defense put in Terry Rolls, a lot of defense to play to, to get it back to where, you, where you'd like it to be. So you may like Matt Kuchar's swing, but Matt Kuchar has short arms and he's a tall guy. He's going to swing flat. If you want to swing like Dustin Johnson and you're not built like him, good luck. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So be who you are and find out who you are. And I'm happy, you know, if you're in the area, I'm happy to tell you who you are because I'll mention you and let you know, right? Yep. So awesome. Well, and to uh, check out more, go to xandergolf.com and then don't forget the Xander Golf app. Is it available for both iOS and Android? It is available for both. And on right. the Xander Golf app, you can see instructional videos and you can also do online lessons. And then I'm mm -hmm. in person at Stanford uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. You can sign up online at xandergolf.com. Awesome. Josh, it's always great to talk to you because all I have to do is say hello and we've got 45 minutes of content. <laughs> At least we can keep going. <laughs> oh, I have many more questions, but we're done for the day. We'll, we'll do it go. another time. My wife is standing at the door going, oh, we have to leave. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Great to be with you, Fred. So last week I said that the video I captured on my first round with the one iron golf single length irons was boring and not worth sharing. <laughs> but I couldn't help myself. I did put together a two and a half minute piece that showed the better shots and my commentary, then posted it onto our Golf Smarter TV channel on YouTube. And last week's episode page, it was also listed there. Uh, thank you so much for all the traffic and for checking it out. Uh, I'll include a link to the video in today's show notes as well. But I've got another update. I practice hitting into a net in my backyard, on my backyard putting green while using the Perfect Motion app. Also went to the local range a couple times and day before yesterday played my second round with these clubs. First, I want to say that these one iron golf black stones are a pleasure to look at, especially at a dress. The black face, the black shafts with the white scoring on the face really jump out at you. And Neil, you remember my playing partner, Neil? Well, it was the first time he'd seen me play with these. He didn't, wasn't there the other time. And he commented multiple times on how nice they look. And this is a guy who picked his golf clubs based on the font on the, the end of the club to see which club it was. Uh, honestly, that's what he told me. Also, um, these clubs arrived uh, in, in my house with, with uh, thicker grips than I'm used to. And frankly, my next re-grips to all my clubs will probably go with these wider grips. It feels really good. Anyway, maybe we should do a show about that too. What do you think? Hmm. Anyway, I played much better, had more good shots than bad shots, and am beginning to get a sense of the distances I hit each club. But there's still some meat on that bone, so I'm not absolutely confident like I am with, uh, well, like I have been with my ping G's. One thing I do want to comment on that Matt Lake mentioned in episode 769 when we learned all about the single length irons from oneirongolf.com is that he said that when you go to the range, you only need to bring one club since they're all the same length. I actually don't agree with that because of the adjustments that you have to make. Maybe it's all mental. But I don't think it is. Now, these clubs that I have are 37 inches long, and it's based on the measurement from the bottom of my wrist to the floor. That's basically the same length as my 7-iron from my Ping G set. So when I'm setting up to hit a shot that would actually require, say, my 5-iron or a hybrid, the Blackstone 23 degree just feels short. And then when I'm hitting my 51 degree Blackstone, which is similar to my U club in the ping set, which is uh, some sort of, it's the gap wedge, it's an inch and a half longer. The Blackstone is an inch and a half longer. Again, there's a mental adjustment that definitely needs for you to get accustomed to. Now, beyond that, I'm actually blown away at the dispersion 
all the way through the set. Already I'm feeling confident going after targets since the ball flight is consistently tight. So yes, I'm going to continue using these clubs as I know that I've got a lot of time to truly understand what they can do for me. But shooting 81 for my second round with these is definitely <laughs> worth another look. And for perspective, over my last 20 rounds, I've only shot under 81 twice in October and August. So it's time for a change, and this change is looking good. Tony Manzoni. Now, if you're not a fan or familiar with his teaching method, then you probably are new to Golf Smarter. Tony passed away in late 2018, and in the eight years that I knew him and featured him on the podcast, he was the one teacher who received more comments and emails than any other, hands down. He wrote a book called The Lost Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever, and followed it up with a DVD. Both the book and the video sold out, but Tony didn't reprint them before he got ill. And after he passed... His co-author, Paul Cervantes, and I worked with his widow to republish the book and make it available in a Kindle format as well. And we've made the video available online. It's probably because the golf podcast market wasn't as crowded as, crowded as it is now, but I honestly think we were the only media outlet other than his local paper that t t took him seriously. How seriously? Well, coming up, for all of March and April 2021, Tony Manzoni will be featured each week on Golf Smarter Mulligans. And those aren't all the episodes we have with him. So starting March 5th, we will replay nine consecutive episodes on Golf Smarter Mulligans. So please subscribe for free to Mulligans wherever you get your favorite podcasts. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions on what you'd like to hear on an upcoming episode, I'd love to hear from you. Use at Golf Smarter in social media. Subscribe to Golf Smarter TV on YouTube. Or just click on the Hey Fred button at GolfSmarter.com.